Okay, so I think we'll start. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Dear brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So my name is Sarah. I'm a junior doctor based in the West Midlands. And today I'm really excited to welcome you all to this webinar on managing chronic diseases in Ramadan. We have a fantastic line of of speakers uh, for you today. But just before, before we get started, I'd like to give you a brief overview of some of the work that we do here at BEMA. So BEMA is a not-for-profit organization that was founded in 2013 to support healthcare professionals and the wider community with a vision to unite, inspire, and serve. It is the only organization in the UK to unite Muslim healthcare professionals from all healthcare disciplines and from all stages and levels, from students through to consultants and retired professionals. Since its inception, the organization has gone from strength to strength and is run by over a thousand volunteers who work tirelessly behind the scenes to deliver all of these projects that you can see on your screen. One example is our flagship Lifesavers project, which we run annually every September and involves volunteers across the UK teaching basic life support skills to their communities and their mosques. Alhamdulillah, it is now a successful project that's been taken internationally by uh, the Federation of Islamic Muslim Associations and has been uh, carried out in nine countries across the world. BEAM has also been in receipt of a number of awards, alhamdulillah, and one of the ones that you can see here in the corner of your screen is an award that was given to the health promotions team for their cervical cancer screening campaign. Another huge milestone for BEMA, and one of the focuses of our talk today, is the creation of this peer-reviewed document by over 60 experts that has brought together evidence-based medicine uh, regarding fasting for those with various medical conditions. And this document has been utilized globally and we will be discussing it more inshallah later on today. On this slide, you can see examples of some of the webinars that our professional, that our professional development team have done in the past. All of them have been recorded and you can find them on YouTube on our British IMA channel. So I wouldn't be able to talk about the work that BEMA has done without speaking about our response to the coronavirus pandemic. Over the past year, BEMA has worked tirelessly to bring evidence-based guidance in relation to COVID. We produced an informative webinar called COVID Question Time with various experts, including virologists, alongside weekly community webinars and debriefs for our members working on the front line. We also work closely with the media and the community to offer clear guidance on ethical issues pertaining to burial and attending the masjid. Part of our COVID response has been to formulate a number of infographics and guidance related to the COVID vaccination, including some of these myth busters, which you can find on all of our social media channels. We've also worked tirelessly to be able to produce information and guidance pertaining to the COVID vaccination. And you can access this on our website uh, and via the QR code that we have on the screen now. So this is all information pertaining to the COVID vaccination during fasting and to the use of lateral flow tests. So coming back to Ramadan, uh, Alhamdulillah, BIMA has been able to partner with the Muslim Council of Britain alongside other organisations to uh, launch this campaign on having a safer Ramadan during the coronavirus pandemic. So there is a number of infographics and information on our websites um, relating to how to have safe iftar, how to visit the mosque safely, uh, including other information on celebrating the Eid, um, Itikaf and Tarawih as well. And I will give you some information at the end uh, with how you can access our website and our social media channels. So just a quick note to say that our webinars are designed to give information that is accurate at the time of presentation. And the views expressed in this webinar are those of the individual speaker and may not necessarily represent the views of BEMA. This webinar is being recorded and you can access the recording after on our YouTube channel. 
There will be opportunities to ask questions and answers to our panel of speakers. So we would encourage you to drop your questions in the question and answer box and we'll try and get through as many of them as possible. We also really value and appreciate your feedback. So please do fill in the feedback form at the end of the webinar and we will drop, in, we will drop the link into the chat box and we'll have a QR code that you can access at the end. And if you can fill in your email addresses, we're happy to send you a certificate of attendance as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker who will be giving a talk on the principles of what excuses one or invalidates one from fasting. So our speaker is Dr. Rafaqat Rashid, who is a traditional Sharia scholar, general practitioner, and an international professional, tra professional trainer and educator. He is the co-founder of al Bala Academy and an, and an academic in the field of Islamic bioethics and medical law, having obtained his master's from the University of Manchester on the subject of Muslim scholarly debates on the issue of organ transplantation. He is also an honorary lecturer at the University of Leeds. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Rafaqat to deliver his talk. Assalamu uh, alaikum warahmatullah. Can I share my uh, slides? Is that okay? I think you might need to make me the host. Okay, inshallah. Okay, so hopefully you can you can uh, see these slides. Okay, inshallah, bismillah. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu ala ibadihi al-lazina astafa. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'alamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassil li amri wa hlu al-uqdata min lisani yafqahu qawli. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to the uh, BIMA webinar on uh, Ramadan and fasting. Now, um, my particular session, or my sort of contribution, will inshallah be related more specifically to uh, the fiqh of fasting. Now, the fiqh of fasting is quite an extensive and intensive sort of subject. However, what I'll be, what I'll be doing is focusing on something which is probably more specific, more relevant to yourselves, as either members of uh, BIMA or general people who have just uh, registered onto this particular webinar. Now, um, I'm quite happy for, for this to be quite interactive. Uh, this shouldn't just be about me speaking, you know, ideally we're all here to learn. So inshallah, by all means do ask questions uh, and I'll, I'll try to address your questions as much as I can. Hopefully the presentation itself will probably address quite a few things. Um, but what I will talk about is just go over briefly the idea of who in the Sharia is excused from fasting. So we'll talk a bit about that. Then we'll talk a bit about safe fasting. Uh, and then finally, we'll leave it to the Q&A at the end. So hopefully I'll, have I'll be able to fit that in the time that I have. So let's just get straight into the people who are excused from fasting. So first of all, we have verses of the Holy Quran. So, O believers, fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you, so that you earn uh, the state of taqwa. You become la'allakum tattakun. So you become those who become the, uh, uh, amongst those who are self-restraining in their deen. Then, um, interestingly, uh, there are verses of the Quran that follow on from this. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ayyama ma'adudat, faman kana minkum maridan ala safarin fa'iddatun min ayyamin ukhur, wa ala alladhina yutiqoonahu fidyatun ta'amu miskin, faman tatawa'a khayran fahuwa khayran lahu, wa antasumu khayran lakum, in kuntum ta'alamun. And the most important part of this verse for us, or relevant for us, is for the bit where it says, faman kana minkum maridan. So for those of you except those, if any of you is ill, or on a journey, let him fast a similar number of days later. So even within, explicitly within the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made uh, fasting uh, incumbent on all Muslims. But yet at the same time, uh, the verse follows on that there are certain uh, exceptions. And those exceptions were those 
who are in essence um, either sick or on a journey. Now, having said this, um, I apologize for this. Um, there are other verses as well which do the same. Um, slides not come out too well, but anyway. But we all know um, a reasonable amount about Ramadan. Um, we recognize that this is a mandatory part of our deen, that we fast so that we gain this spiritual state where we become more obedient to our creator. But we also recognize that this is one of the important pillars of Islam and when the, the fast actually begins. We also recognize suhoor and iftar. I don't need to go into the details of this. This is something that's quite clear to you all. So suhoor is the meal before dawn. Uh, people call it sehari uh, and uh, many other names, but generally speaking, then we also have iftar. So iftar is the meal after sunset where we normally open our fast with dates or water. So these are all important things. The other important thing sometimes is that we don't always take into consideration, especially when we look at ill people and sick people, is the taraweeh. So it's the, uh, the night prayers, which can potentially last for approximately one hour to one and a half hours and can be quite physically demanding, especially for the sick or the frail elderly. So these are things that we need to take into consideration uh, as in terms of acts of worship during this holy month of Ramadan. Now, um, also, the one of the last things is etikaf. So that is something that uh, maybe we might be able to address later on. Now, this particular slide will, um, in essence, lay out the main groups of people who are usually exempt from fasting. So, yes, fasting is uh, uh, an obligation. Everybody should fast who, uh, who is within the age uh, where they have uh, reached some sense of maturity. So generally speaking, children under the age of 12 years are usually excused from fasting. Now, balur uh, or uh, maturity uh, or puberty uh, would be the time where uh, this becomes now an obligation that you must fast. But you will also recognize that we have children who also are very keen to fast. And we should sort of measure that up in terms of uh, their capacity, their understanding of fasting, number one, their ability to fast, whether they've fasted before. So these are the things that we should take into, into consideration. Now, uh, like my children, for example, I have children who are, mashallah, are very quite young. Um, and even in their younger years, they were very keen on fasting. They saw mother and father fast. So their siblings fast, and so they were very keen on fasting as well. So clearly you can already see that uh, key, key, kids can be very keen in fasting. So you need to really weigh this up well, uh, and inshallah, you know, slowly, gradually get them into the whole scheme of uh, fasting in Ramadan. But there are other people who are, uh, who are incapable of fasting due to uh, a number of reasons. One may be physical weakness. So patient who is uh, maybe acutely unwell. So they may have a, a virus or illness uh, or frail or elderly. The other is terminal diseases. So people who are in uh, end stage or terminal conditions like, such as cancer. Um, uh, and in those particular cases, there are certain forms of compensation that we will talk about such as fidya. We'll, we'll mention that in a short while. Then also you have people who are, have chronic diseases. So diabetics, some people who are maybe on insulin, also, uh, patients with bronchitis, um, and these, in some instances, especially those who have severe condition, would be exempt from fasting. Now, sometimes we don't always take into consideration people with mental illnesses, but that is clearly uh, an, also an exemption, um, or even those who are learning impaired. So they don't have uh, the understanding of the rulings. They don't have what we call tamiz, to be able to differentiate uh, between uh, number one, right and wrong. Uh, also, the inability to understand the rulings of fasting uh, and to be able to uh, uh, apply that to their daily life. So um, from that particular, particular perspective, even people who have mental illness, sometimes, uh, especially if they have psychosis or uh, other additional symptoms, which would actually prevent them from having a fuller understanding of the rulings and uh, uh, be able to apply them, um, they would also be exempt. Now, we also have um, pregnant or breastfeeding mothers uh, whose health or child's health will suffer from fasting. 
uh, and again they can do uh, they can do qada they can make up for the fast uh, or, or fast on, uh, at, uh, at an alternative time but these kind of women usually uh, you know um, the ruling is that they should really be uh, trying to fast they should attempt to fast uh, and if there are specific reasons uh, uh, specific to them uh, that uh, for example weakness and various other things which we'll talk about um, these uh, would be reasons for them to be excused but generally by default even pregnant women and breastfeeding women should be fasting then we have menstruating women so menstruating women are uh, women who are clearly in a state of ritual impurity and uh, so are women who have uh, nifas uh, so postpartum bleeding they are clearly exempt from fasting they should not be fasting anyway uh, during the month of ramadan um, then finally we have those who are traveling uh, so musafir uh, individuals who are traveling so specific distance then they are also exempt from fasting as well so that's sort of a general outline uh, of uh, the exemptions that are made and inshallah hopefully some of the other speakers will talk about some of the individual areas more specifically now i'm just going to briefly outline uh, atonement and expiation so i'll just mention terminologies and then i'll just explain what they all mean uh, for your for your benefit so we have what we call qada qada is just to make up so we have ada ada is you uh, fasting on that particular day within the time uh, that's been stipulated for fasting and qada would in essence refer to uh, when a situation where you are making up for that day that you have lost in terms of fasting in ramadan which becomes an obligation on those people who are able to do this so uh, you make up for a missed fast of ramadan on another day other than the month of Ramadan. The other is um, fidya. So fidya is if qada cannot be made, then, then the expectation that is then you make some kind of atonement, which is a fidya, we call that fidya. And this is when somebody cannot fast in a Ramadan and they can't make up the fast, uh, the lost days afterwards. For example, due to uh, a clinic, chronic illness, frailty, old, uh, old age, etc. So they should then pay for someone else to be fed. So they, this is a, uh, a fidya that they were expected to pay in that respect and there's a certain amount of fidya which different sort of scholars sort of give uh, in terms of a fixed amount uh, that you must pay uh, on the basis of that so then we have what we call kafara kafara sometimes can be a bit more complex but generally speaking this is a form of expiation and this is a penalty that uh, one is uh, expected to expiate on the basis of intentional uh, uh, invalidation of your fast so this is to do with a compensation that you pay when you deliberately break a fast in the month of Ramadan without a valid reason and it has to be uh, through what we call the manfasil asli in other words through those main routes where we eat and drink so in other words if we swallow something intentionally etc so uh, that's uh, another sort of detailed area but generally speaking here you're expected to fast for 60 consecutive fasts or feed poor people two, two meals for 60 days. This is the general, the 60 consecutive fast is the default position. That's what you should be doing. And if you are frail or elderly and you're not able to do that, then you're expected to, uh, to feed the poor. Okay, so inshallah, hopefully we might get some opportunity to talk a bit about them in, in more detail later on. Now, regarding safe fasting, um, there's a couple of things that we, um, we will just briefly outline and maybe we'll get a, a chance to talk about this in the Q&A. But here you have um, some interesting uh, uh, situations, sometimes that we, you know, we need to really contemplate and we need to talk about when it comes to fasting. So here you, you may have an example of a person who suffers from asthma and they have hay fever um, and clearly they need their asthma inhaler. Um, so the question arises, does uh, using an asthma inhaler invalidate your fast? Um, so you have some differences of opinion regarding that. Um, we'll talk a bit about those difference of opinion. The uh, uh, sort of uh, one particular opinion, uh, which is my opinion as well, is that uh, use of inhalers actually invalidates your fast or breaks your fast. So for that reason, then you need to sort of think about a, a plan around how you would manage asthmatics and clearly those are using 
nasal spray so nasal spray would not invalidate your fast but generally speaking uh, unless you uh, uh, passed your throat um, but generally speaking you may have people who take antihistamines tablets and things like that which would clearly invalidate your fast so there, there, there needs to be some kind of management plan around these kind of patients frail elderly women with, uh, who are positive for COVID-19 that's an interesting case so you've got an elderly woman who's asymptomatic has just been uh, given a, a stated that she's got a positive test for COVID-19. How do you deal with that? And this is an interesting thing that we'll talk about in a short while. A young man with severe back pain, clearly requiring analgesia, pain relief for, the, for, for his back. He's not able to move around. He's quite immobile because of it. A woman recently delivered, suffering from postnatal depression. Is she expected to fast? Um, how do we assess this? How do, what kind of things do we uh, observe to actually uh, give the right sort of uh, uh, opinion regarding what do the Fokaha, the Muslim jurists say regarding this? A diabetic patient on insulin. These are some of the considerations that we need to have. Surgeon who has full operation list all day. So he's clearly going to be a very busy individual in an environment which can be quite stuffy, warm, um, have a, you know, a mask uh, and... Uh, you know, in an environment where you know the surgeon would have to be uh, concentrating with, uh, otherwise it could be quite detrimental for the patient. Uh, so these are important sort of scenarios. So how do we uh, sort of look at the issue of you know them being exempt from fasting? Now, this is why I call the the four principle approach. And the four principle approach, generally. These are the four things that uh, the Muslim jurists talk about when we should look at ill individuals. Now, the other speakers will go into more detail, but generally speaking, you can see here that the four principles generally focus on uh, things like, for example, number one, is their condition going to worsen? Is their physical condition going to worsen on the basis of them fasting? So that's the first thing you'd look at. Um, also, Will it slow? Uh, will the recovery be, will, will that become slowed down? Or will it, are we going to have a slower recovery uh, if this is a condition which is quite fatal and clearly there is a slower recovery because of them fasting? Is that uh, a concern? The the third is will their pain increase uh, so quite significantly? Will they uh, feel greater level of pain? So clearly, somebody who takes regular pain relief through the day. And they're fasting they're not able to take that kind of uh, pain relief uh, orally so how would that be affected um, and also finally worsening mental conditions so if they were to fast would their condition worsen would they uh, end up uh, a lot more depressed uh, would their symptomatology increase uh, in terms of their detriment to their general uh, ability to perform their daily chores now the question arises at what point do we say that the condition has uh, disqualifies a worsening physical condition, or the, the recovery is now slowed down, or the mental health has worsened, or the pain has become worse. Where is the threshold that we decide that this is a, now the time that we can say that you are exempt? And the, the response to that is that if they are unable to physically, mentally perform normal and important daily chores. So in other words, they're struggling getting around the house because of this worsening physical condition the slower recovery the worsening mental condition worsening pain the regular chores like you know the important elements of hygiene they're not able to bathe themselves because of this condition uh, worsening and um, they're not able to uh, care for their children uh, uh, you know uh, on the basis of what is needed and is necessary because of their condition uh, and not necessarily just the fact that they can't go to work because work is not considered as something which would be necessary and i will talk a bit about work um, because there are certain conditions that we need to attach to work and how we deal with that now let's say for example you have gout uh, and you have a clear understanding and experience that when you have gout it becomes very severe and it causes some serious problems for you you become immobile you got it in your big toe uh, and you're really struggling now those kind of individuals they have what we call tajriba they have this sense of experience and they know those kind of individuals, if they know with dominant probability, now there's 75% chance, over 75% chance, that I know that I'm going to end up in a real bad situation when I fast, then that they have that ability to make that decision themselves in terms of whether they should be fasting that day or not. 
Um, well, we will talk a bit about that uh, with, with the next sort of couple of slides. But generally speaking, this is the general outline, which I call the four principle approach that you need to take into consideration when making those decisions about whether you should be fasting or not. Now, there's something important about fasting and hardship. So there are certain uh, texts in the books of fit which make reference to this. So if a person's work is hard and he will be harmed by giving it up and he is afraid of physical harm, then he may break the fast and make it up later. Also with regards to those whose work involves physical effort, who are in need of their earnings, such as bakers and harvesters. So clearly if you're really dependent on that, uh, that the, the, the pay that you get from your work and you, know, you do really need to, fa uh, to work, those kind of individuals can also be uh, exempt if it prevents them to, uh, to work appropriately. Yeah? If he knows that if he works, he will encounter harm that may make it permissible for him not to fast, then in that case, it is haram for him to break the fast before he actually encounters hardship. Now, this is a very important point, And that is that um, if you feel that you will undergo hardship and there's a chance that you will break the fast, that would not give you an excuse not to fast that day. But rather what you need to do is you need to fast and if you feel that hardship and you feel very weak because of this to the degree that i mentioned in the previous four principle approach um, then then you can actually break your fast and it's better for you to do it that way rather than just to think you know i'm going to have a hard day and therefore i must not fast so this is an important point to to raise and then you can that person can do qada of that fast another another day so it also mentions it is not permissible for a worker to break the fast during the day in Ramadan just because he is working. But if he encounters great hardship that forces him to break the fast during the day, then he may break the fast with something that will ward off that hardship. Then refrain from eating and drinking until Maghrib. So in other words, even if you are to break the fast because you feel weak, then you should not you know, have a you know, full meal, but rather you should still imitate those who are fasting, have the minimum that you require in terms of fluids and food, just to keep you going for the day. Uh, and you know, do that sort of uh, secretly rather than openly in public, uh, and sort of con contain and continue with the remaining rituals of, the, of Ramadan, uh, and, and, and continue in this particular manner, even though you've had to break your fast. So, um, Okay, inshallah. So when is a worker excused? So going back to the issue of the doctor, surgical uh, operative list, the weakness due to fasting must be a real cause, a real risk leading to these, uh, these, these conditions. Okay, so we talked about physical mental harm to self. Um, um, the other thing is he, the person will need to start fasting and can only break fast when feels weak. And the third is the intention is essential. So they must deliberately choose to work during so if they deliberately choose to work during fasting hours so that it gives them an excuse this is not acceptable so they should ideally uh, shift their day in a way or uh, you know uh, make it a, a bit of an easy month during the month of ramadan that you know their surgical lists are not long etc or the surgery is not too long that they feel that they're not too burdened by that work take some time off during take your annual leave during that time these are the things that you so you need to prepare for ramadan uh, in that sense, but rather than doing it deliberately, I know I'll have a long list and I just won't fast. That's not really acceptable. And also recognizing that you would need to make up uh, for the fast, the qada. Now, there are a number of reasons why uh, individuals like, for example, surgeons and people like that, like people from the medical profession, may be excused in those instances. One is the physical mental harm to self. Also medical legal reasons. So if you're in a uh, uh, operating on somebody and it's quite an important operation, quite a delicate one, uh, clearly you need to be uh, fully mentally there uh, so that you can focus and concentrate. Otherwise, uh, it could put you in a serious issue of negligence. So those would be another reasons, you know, that would potentially exempt you. Uh, also, significant risk of losing your job or earning. This is another reason that the Muslim jurists mention. And uh, the other is risk of harm to the patient. So these are things that you would need to take into consideration. But rather, as individuals, ideally, you should approach a mufti or somebody who is well, uh, has a good understanding of this particular area uh, and get some kind of uh, uh, their feedback on what would be the most appropriate thing. But you need to use preventative means. These are important. So work on the, uh, manage your month well, a uh, month of Ramadan. You know, if you need to shift some of the busy elements in your, in your life during this month, then do that so that you can fast comfortably 
and safely during this month, inshallah. Just final slide, um, that is to fast or not to fast. And we have to recognize that people are not, we're not all the same. So it does depend on decision making of individuals. And the important considerations that they normally have is uh, the person themselves, their, their type, their personality, the decision of the individual. Also, um, uh, um, uh, their religious practice, you know, how they practice their faith. Are they quite religious? Uh, are they sort of not as uh, practicing? And also uh, how they take on medical opinion. So some people are very clearly, you know, to the, to the letter when it comes to medical opinion. Others, they would, you know, uh, they would take a bit of more, more of a risk. So you'll find that different individuals as patients or as medical professionals, each one of us, we have different sort of threshold levels to each one of these areas. So we need to take in to consideration the person as an individual and not necessarily use principles uh, as a general universal sort of approach to every single person. Okay, inshallah. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, and if there's any questions, inshallah, we'll hopefully uh, we, we can sort of talk about some of those things. These are some of the questions that I put, uh, the exercise I put as forms of reflection. So inshallah, we might be able to address them in some of the questions. Okay, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Rafa Fat, for that really interesting talk. We do have a few questions. Um, in the interests of time, uh, we might be able to answer them throughout the course of the webinar. Uh, but there are a couple of questions in the question and answer box. Uh, okay, so I think let's move on to our next talk, inshallah. Hello, as alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. Good. So our next talk, our next speaker, uh, will be discussing the Bima Ramadan health guidance with a focus on managing diabetes in Ramadan. So Dr. Guri is a consultant in diabetes, endocrinology and general medicine at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow and an honorary clinical senior lecturer at the University of Glasgow. He has a particular interest in the management of patients, particularly those with diabetes and endocrine disease and fasting in Ramadan. Uh, having published novel papers and spoken nationally on this topic. He is also a student of sacred Islamic knowledge and is one of the first two students to have successfully completed the full I syllabus curriculum. So without further ado, Dr. Guri, uh, you're welcome to give the talk, inshallah. Okay, so inshallah, uh, I'm going to uh, start with everybody. Jazakallah khair for inviting me. I'm going to share my screen and get all the technical stuff out of the way first. So let's see here. Okay, so that's that. You can all see my screen? Yes, we can see the screen. Okay, perfect, okay. So, Jazakallah Khair for introducing me, uh, uh, Sister Sarah. Um, so, I am one of the two main editors originally of the BIMA guidance that came out last year, uh, in essence, uh, and I'll mention this brother, Salman came up with the idea and I kind of shaped the idea based on my prior experience of managing patients with uh, diabetes primarily, but also medical conditions in Ramadan, my background of being a student of knowledge, as well as my academic background, kind of bringing it all together. So a lot to get through with my session. I don't know if I'll get through all of it because I'll probably get a yellow card out with five minutes to go. Uh, but in essence, I want to focus on the guidance itself to help people understand it. I'm not going to go through everything in the guidance. The idea is that you read it and you apply it as needed with your patients. Uh, and I'll touch a bit about diabetes. Again, to do a diabetes section, uh, session properly, I need to give it a full 45 minutes to do it justice. Uh, so I'm just going to pick a few things to highlight the flavor of it more than anything else. The guidance is being revised for this year, so it's a bit more structured and a bit more uh, kind of longer with a longer term vision. Uh, moving away from the rapid review type uh, stage, I'll touch upon this during the presentation, inshallah. It should hopefully go live later today. So, uh, what is the compendium? How it was the genesis of it? Who's involved? A bit about how it's prepared, the principles, a bit of an acute illness uh, and chronic disease and the future. And within the chronic disease, I will touch on diabetes, inshallah. So, let me just move things out of the way here. So I can see the end of my slides. Okay, so I'm just trying to move my own picture. That's better. So research 
and Ramadan is still quite nascent. Although diabetes have had guidelines for about 15 years now, uh, the, it was generally opinion-based. There are a few studies, more studies have been coming out, but certainly with other uh, specialties, other medical conditions, there's very, there's very little uh, original data. When I mean original data, research-based data from studies and things, or even from observational studies, most of it's kind of opinion and consensual statements based on the, the thoughts of others combined uh, with some practical experience. Uh, so, uh, with that in mind, really the, the objective of this guidance was to try and bring other conditions almost into line with diabetes in terms of providing some kind of structured guidance to make it easy to manage patients. And indeed, there are some questions to do with Crohn's disease that I had just read, which I shall hopefully try and touch on. Uh, and in order to form guidance, you obviously want people who understand uh, uh, the condition at hand, to understand Ramadan, and to be able to uh, uh, do the drama or the reconciliation, bring things together in terms of providing some kind of information and guidance to uh, patients, uh, but more importantly to healthcare pra uh, practitioners so that they can have a consultation with their patients and help them make a decision that's informed. Um, as I mentioned last year's rapid review really kind of came about because of quote, the pandemic and people have been thinking a bit more seriously about health, but I think in order to, to bring this, make this a more beneficial document to the community, I wanted to make it a more longer term or permanent guidance, uh, which is updated when needed, rather than just every year. And uh, therefore, we've kind of devolved each specialty with its own uh, uh, with the responsibility to take care of it, take care of its own methodology. Uh, and if they haven't got a kind of methodology in place, we've gone with the default methodology from the rapid review as a starting point. The good thing, alhamdulillah, is that a year on, we have at least five or six publications relating to the various sections in peer-reviewed literature. Uh, so for example, diabetes, adrenal disease, uh, epilepsy, uh, cardiology sitting with a review, a renal disease, uh, to name uh, a few, uh, occupational health as well. And these are in reputable journals, either uh, in leading journals or certainly journals that, uh, journals that have a British flavor or uh, to things. Uh, and this has improved the quality of the content by virtue of external peer review. So in essence, some of these sections are abridged uh, versions of these, uh, of these papers and therefore external peer review. The more peer reviewed it is, now it's P-E-E-R as in like your, your colleagues as opposed to P-I-R as in a saint reviewing it, uh, just to help differentiate between the two. But the advantage of peer review is that it allows for people to get a bit of peace of mind knowing that this guidance is, is not just in-house, it's been reviewed by other bodies as well. Uh, now, ultimately, uh, the final decision rests with the individual concerned. Uh, so for example, it's not for us to force a patient to do something. We can make them know our thoughts and our, and our preferences for things, but the decision is theirs. Uh, and as far as possible, that will be guided by a cllinician and where necessary an imam as well, just as per uh, uh, Sheikh Rashid's comments in terms of when we're trying to understand some of the Sharia components, particularly for those clinicians who are less familiar with that. Um, in terms of the guidance itself, the opening sections are on the general principles, the occupational aspects, acute illness, risk stratification and sick day rules with some uh, specific guidance on COVID as well as vaccination. And again, it is basically taking the principles that uh, Dr. Rafakat talked about, but putting them in a kind of practical uh, perspective so that it's easy to apply for a, a clinician or an HCP. And then each disease condition uh, section discusses some common chronic, uh, some of the chronic conditions pertaining to that and their management. And also people discusses the uh, potential role of COVID-19, if there are any specific considerations. And this is why I don't want to go through it, everything in the guidance, but really direct you to the guidance so you can read and see for yourself uh, what the, how that is uh, manifested. Uh, I can't even see the, height, the headings of my own slide because of the room. Here we go. Uh, so in terms of uh, the key points, uh, uh, the advice is to the best of our knowledge compatible with the Sharia uh, and uh, that uh, allowing for scholarly difference of opinion and some of the things, uh, but, uh, but the point of this type of guidance, it gives the assurance to uh, the reader and inshallah to the patient that this is Sharia compliant. This is very important when it comes to financial matters as well, what people are interested in knowing that Sharia compliant or not. Uh, there are references to papers which have references to primary texts uh, from fiqh, uh, for example, like what uh, Dr. Rafakat has uh, referenced, so, similar to the, so there is, at, uh, at the end of the day, reference to these types of uh, resources if one were to dig. 
the guidance should be read as informative recommendations rather than authoritative or prescriptive directives. Uh, and like I said, although some of these papers have been published in peer reviewed literature, so it does add uh, a bit more weight to the guidance uh, within the different sections. Mr. Daisy. My slides have stopped moving, one second. There you go. So Sheikh Hassan Yusuf, who is the current chair for the BBSI, British Board and Scholars of Imams, who is also one of the contributors, uh, uh, succinctly described the guidance as uh, the guidance that fills a gap when it comes to getting advice uh, uh, when a patient can already access an appropriate Muslim physician to understand the medical ailment at hand, as well as the importance of the role of fasting during Ramadan in the life of a Muslim. So basically, this guidance helps bridge that gap between the medical and the religious side of things to make it easy for uh, individuals to make decisions uh, that are hopefully uh, religiously sensitive. So who's involved? Uh, this is not a one-man band by any means, and this is not even done by a, a few people. This has actually required well over 50 people to bring this together, not only last year, but also the revision this year as well. Um, and I think there were around about 65 healthcare professionals and clinical academics in the form of editors, contributors, peer reviewers, uh, uh, and, and as well, and this also includes some fresh blood that has come in this year. For example, the diabetes section has been written by uh, primarily by Haris Ahmed, uh, Said Haris Ahmed. Uh, so, fresh blood has been introduced as well. The important common thing is that all have an interest or experience in the management of patients in Ramadan. Um, some are experts in, in this area specifically, but at least they're experts in their specialty, so they understand all the ailments and can provide sound clinical guidance. Uh, we've got scholarly in involvement and approval, and we've got students of knowledge uh, background for some people. So this all adds to the overall weight and to the caliber of uh, the, um, uh, the authorship and editorship for the, of the guidance. And some of us have a national and international standing recognition at professional and academic level. In terms of the four main editors, uh, Salman Wakar conceived the idea uh, and was the engine behind the original project. Uh, he then got me involved. Uh, him and I had a bit of an argument on the matter in terms of the shape and direction of the guidance, but uh, it fortunately didn't come to blows because of social distancing. But uh, in the end, we, we have what we have now, alhamdulillah, and really it's a, a credit to Salman for at least letting me bend his ear uh, and being, being able to pull really all the specialty together because able to, he really managed to get everybody on board that first time around, and that cannot be underestimated. As for myself, uh, um, my, you've heard my kind of bio, I don't want to labour the point on things. I've published several papers related to diabetes as well as other medical conditions. I understand how the guidance should work. I understand how a paper should be read and written. So that's where I lend my support to things. Ahmad Mahmoud has joined the editorial board and really he has been uh, uh, doing a lot of the, the donkey work. Uh, he's been the engine room this year. Um, uh, he's been up till very late. Uh, uh, of uh, recent nights uh, and still been uh, really pulling things together. He's uh, had not, uh, he's got a very meticulous eye as well, which helps when you're trying to uh, bring things together and maintain a standard. And finally, Professor Tahseen Chowdhury, uh, who's well known to many in the professional circle. Uh, he's involved uh, uh, with various aspects of diabetes. He's contributed to the IDFDR Ramadan guidance, uh, and he's helped with the revising and the reviewing of uh, the current version. I'm not going to read every single contributor's name, but this, these are the main contributors to uh, the guidance, and you'll see some familiar names there. Um, I think there's a good 30 names or so put on this list throughout the UK. Men, women, doctors, uh, non-clinicians, uh, scholars, you've got the lot. So in terms of actually pulling all this guidance together, uh, we've obviously kind of given a flavour in terms of how the structure was. But the important thing is what is trying to reach consensual recommendations because it's very easy for someone to have a view on something and somebody else uh, to uh, feel differently. So one of the beauties and I think one of the blessings of this guidance uh, is that we have been able to, where people slightly different things, come to a German or a reconciliation with things where we've been able to give sound advice but recognize uh, the, the subtleties as well as the fact that there is no hard evidence for some things and you really are going on principles and because of that everybody can have a slightly different take on on things but alhamdulillah we're able to incorporate it all 
And that's the beauty of such things that despite having a slight difference, we can still have common themes and, and guidance available. And I said another important thing is that we've tried to focus on COVID-19, bringing in relevant aspects without overdoing it because I'm hoping this pandemic will leave us uh, in the next uh, year, inshallah. So, uh, but at the same point, recognizing the specifics that affect us at this point in time. Uh, and the important thing to realize with the DAR guy, uh, with this guidance is that we're using the, the traffic light system, if you like, in terms of very high risk, high risk, and low and moderate risk, which is what uh, um, the uh, Diabetes and Ramadan Alliance and International Diabetes Federation have used. Um, uh, these criteria have been approved by the Islamic Organization for Medical Sciences and International FIP, Islamic uh, FIP Academy. It basically means that this concept of risk stratification has uh, got a basis. Uh, from a kind of religious or scholarly perspective. And again, the important thing to remember is this is not like your NICE guidelines or your SIGN guidelines. Uh, the, the important thing with this is, is uh, to, this guidance document is there to help serve as a starting point and to guide the patient uh, uh, clinician or ACP interaction. Uh, it, it's not there to replace clinical judgment. So a bit of a flavor of the guidance. Um, the most important thing is that it's reassuring for those that are healthy. The importance of general principle of looking after oneself and being responsible. Uh, the fact that people should take responsibility for, uh, um, uh, patients should have a take responsibility to engage with their GP or healthcare practitioner in advance of Ramadan so that if there are certain issues that need to be addressed, they do so in a timely manner and a responsible manner so they don't cause harm to themselves or put uh, pressure on uh, their GPs or doctors or nurses because this is still a very busy time for many of us busy with the pandemic, many of us are still trying to catch up with ourselves in terms of just trying to have some uh, mental peace. Uh, and naturally, everybody will want to help people during Ramadan, but at the same time, if we leave it too late, neither can we do the job properly, uh, neither uh, um, will the patient be able to do it safely. Um, there's, uh, there's also some guidance on PPE as well and how that may come into play. Uh, again, this point of uh, slight difference uh, of opinion is there and recognized, and also the importance of the spiritual dimension. And this is something that we feel that our guidance is unique in, in that where a lot of uh, guidance in the past may have talked about truly the medical side of things, we are trying to factor in the spiritual and religious aspects for an individual so that we're a bit more sensitive with our decision making. Uh, we understand the spiritual well being of a patient, and that is why we try and balance things between giving the appropriate sound medical advice but not overlooking what may be important spiritually for an individual, uh, but hence uh, the importance of education in terms of people understanding principles so that we can then understand where the rules come from. Um, in terms of acute illness, again, the decision to pass or otherwise rest with the patient. Uh, in terms of when it comes to COVID symptoms that are, that are, that are key, for example, fever, malaise, uh, persistent cough, we advise the terminating and abstaining of fasting uh, to ensure that uh, health is not compromised because they know that particularly from the higher risk groups that are uh, that many Muslims are from, but be it from an age or ethnicity perspective, there are going to be uh, uh, high patients who will suffer. So it's important of being proactive with things. Uh, and again, they should be a, 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 with non-COVID illness, as per what Dr. Rafakat has said, those principles are ad, ad, highlighted throughout the guidance. And this flow diagram here uh, helps uh, people understand what we're talking about. So for example, whether it's COVID symptoms or otherwise, uh, you might break the fast or abstain from fasting uh, uh, based on the kind of criteria that was talked about. Uh, when it comes to the COVID-19 symptoms, uh, obviously this is a new condition we're learning about things, hence the common knowledge that is evolving. Uh, uh, the advice of an appropriate clinician are important whether a person breaks the fast or abstains from fasting. When it comes to chronic diseases, again, decision rests with the patient. Uh, the um, uh, figures, uh, figure two and table one can be used by healthcare practitioners to uh, ask, assign the risk level to an individual uh, so that they can understand where their starting point is when it comes to fasting. Um, it's important that whilst we use the terms must not and should not fast, we can't force a patient to do anything, but it's to highlight the importance of their medical condition and the risk that they're at if they engage in fasting so that uh, they understand why we're concerned uh, about uh, potential fasting. Um, 
they should consider advising patients to fast in the shorter winter months if possible. For example, there are medication which cannot be taken once a day, but needs to be taken twice a day, like an epilepsy or twice daily insulin, where safe alternatives are not there. Then obviously fasting in the winter will allow uh, the days to, uh, that are missed to be made up without compromising health. Uh, and even with those with lower moderate uh, uh, risk, uh, again, it's about still discussing with their patients because remember, there might be things that may not be uh, pertinent to the patient, but a physician might pick up on to at least be aware of so that they can monitor health and take action as necessary. Um, and it is also recognized that some uh, clinicians will differ with each other. Uh, an imam can also be a useful person to, uh, to consult if you're trying to understand what, to, uh, uh, what the clinician should be looking out for. But at the end of the day, the clinician will still know the medical condition better than the, the religious authority, unless they, for example, are a scholar or a student of knowledge who also are a doctor, in which case they're in a very unique and privileged situation. In terms of the specialties covered in the chronic disease management, we have cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, chronic kidney disease, uh, gastrointestinal disease, diabetes and endocrine condition, uh, neurological disease. There's uh, a bit on pregnancy as well. Malignancies, including pneumatological as well as uh, solid organ tumors, and uh, uh, also benign uh, pneumological disease, and also mental health. And I think at least three or four of these sections have been published in peer-reviewed literature with one under review for, with a revision. In terms of chronic disease, again, the, the flow diagram helps to frame uh, the, the patient's uh, health into one of the three uh, categories. Uh, table one should be used in conjunction with the figure. Table one has examples of various ailments for the different specialties in terms of what will follow classes at very high risk, high and lower moderate risk. Um, and an important thing that we have given importance to is previous experience of fasting with the condition because they may have fasted but it'd be interesting to know did they compromise health, were there any adverse outcomes or were things safe? Because all this experience helps guide the clinician in making the best decision for the patient. Uh, again, even though somebody may be in a category that shouldn't be fasting, we we'll, uh, have advised the healthcare practitioner or professional to support the patient as much as they can if they're choosing still to fast, but it should be very clear that they're going against medical advice and this should really be documented uh, for medical legal purposes. And again, alternatives to fasting, for example, winter fasting or intermittent fasting should be there. Uh, trial fasting prior to Ramadan is also useful in the voluntary Fast, for example, in Shaban, this is useful because it helps generate evidence and experience, as well as importantly, giving some confidence to the, uh, to the clinician as well as the patient to see whether fasting can be embarked for a full month or not. In terms of the table itself, uh, the conditions are uh, listed according to disease, uh, sorry, to specialty, uh, and a bit of general guidance is given there at the start of the table. Respiratory disease is just shown to, uh, as an example of how these conditions. Um, uh, kind of fit into the tables. Again, uh, these are not prescriptive, these are purely uh, um, guidance-based. At the end, we've got a number of notes that are there, are there, for example, to highlight the fact that COVID-19 might change or alter some risk uh, from a slightly lower to high risk. Uh, and again, this is subject to review based on evidence that comes about. Uh, all, um, there's also issues related to mental capacity in terms of the exemptions from fasting. There's some guidance on breastfeeding, which is linked directly to the MCD guidance fact sheets, which you should be aware of. Uh, there's been some frailty there. Also, there was a question to frailty. So again, frailty is recognised, and there's some guidance in, uh, within, the, uh, the, uh, within the document in terms of how to understand frailty and apply it when it comes to risk stratification. Now, diabetes. I'm not going to labour the point too much with uh, uh, diabetes because it's very vast. But I want to use diabetes as an example of how to use the guidance, really. So one thing the guidance does not replace is consulting with your patient prior to Ramadan starting, ideally uh, at least one, but ideally closer to three months before, and explore and address the, uh, do they want to fast, uh, the prior experience of fasting, uh, do they want to discuss with a Muslim physician? You can't necessarily offer it, but at least try and find out if that is the case. It's an opportunity to lose weight and stop smoking. And again, the concept of exercise we talked about by Dr. Rafakat. Um, and again, some specific Ramadan issues, uh, specific issues, for example, dietary advice, timing of food, uh, physical activity, monitoring of sugars, and setting clear parameters for safe fasting. 
In terms of uh, things to discuss with the patient, this is again just to kind of highlight the value of a pre-Ramadan consultation, which may ultimately allow then for you to reach into kind of two main decisions. Does the patient fast or, or did not fast based on their risk categorization? And the, the guidance for diabetes is largely taken from the IDFDR guidance because it's comprehensive. Although the new guidance has moved to more a more risk scoring system as opposed to a risk categorization based on condition, the general principles otherwise are, are important. I still have reservation with the scoring system. I do think that it does overlook a lot of religious considerations, for example, uh, concept of fasting in the winter, as well as it oversimplifies risk uh, and doesn't really give, uh, uh, is not as patient centric as it could be. Uh, but watch this space is all I will say. Again, within this uh, work, uh, cognition, intercurrent illness, pregnancy, breastfeeding, all the things that one would expect to, to be considered should be considered. In terms of what we've kind of put into the very high risk and high risk categories for diabetes, this is taken direct from the guidance. Um, fairly obvious uh, things. Uh, the important thing to recognize is that you'll find that when it comes to very high risk and high risk, either there's one aspect that is very, very significant or severe, or it's a combination of two or three different things. And, and that's what tips the apple cart into a risk of uh, not fasting. Um, uh, in terms of uh, upgrading of risk uh, because of COVID, that very last comment, type 2 diabetes is an SGLT2 inhibitor that should have an asterisk there. Uh, and I, just to really highlight that in patients who are on this type of treatment, particularly poor control, because they can experience quite significant adverse outcomes from COVID, uh, they may move into a higher risk. But again, it's about discussing things with a clinician because it, what may be suitable for one patient may not be suitable for another. Um, and, in, and, and the key message that's come out is make use of the risk stratification, be responsible in terms of maintaining and looking after your health during the fasting, including checking uh, blood sugars, uh, acting on appropriate uh, uh, extremes of blood sugars. The important thing is patient choice and the concept of should versus must. Uh, for example, in the DAR guidance, it says that uh, um, if somebody's got blood sugar over 17, you should break the fast. But I'm not convinced that if somebody's used to having a sugar of over 17, whether they should be breaking the fast versus somebody who's usually having tight control, who gets that sugar of over 17, in which case they could be quite symptomatic from dehydration, from the osmotic diuresis. The important thing is that during Ramadan, we should ensure that patients uh, have access to ongoing support uh, and also to, the, to not be uh, too stubborn with things and to actually stop fasting if they're struggling. And also after Ramadan, have a Ramadan review to see how things went. If you can leave it till next Ramadan, you'll forget. So try and having a timely post-Ramadan review is important this is for any chronic condition so that we can under capture what went well and also learn from what didn't go as well. Within the guidance, there's, there are tables to do with management and changing of uh, tablets in terms of what should be done or should uh, are best uh, adopted. Again, please refer to the guidance. I do not want to labor people too much with uh, those tables here. Uh, another thing to consider is will the patient actually engage with checking their blood sugars, for example? Are they going to follow the DVLA advice? So this comes back to the medical legal aspect of things. Will they do things responsibly? Uh, issues with hypoglycemic unaware, uh, unaware, uh, awareness or unawareness, going to UTIs, all these things that can, uh, can impact uh, a safe Ramadan, all these things are important to be considered. Uh, and I see a point here they made. This guy is, can, can it be used in a legal standing to stop healthcare, uh, uh, stop HCP fasting by an OCH? Department? These guidance or, or these, or these or suggestions are not authoritative or prescriptive. They are, they are based on expert opinion and therefore should help shape discussion. We do not have any legal standing in and of themselves. A bit of a lag here coming back to my presentation. Sorry. On the whole, people have been quite uh, favorable uh, and had positive responses to the guidance from last year in particular. Uh, the British Thoracic Society, Royal College of Physicians London, uh, various CCGs have uh, mentioned and promoted and even advised uh, individuals to follow the guidance. So the hope is as more peer-reviewed papers come out, the guidance acquires more credibility. Uh, and the hope is that at some point in time to get the, the guidance recognized by the Royal College, 
we don't expect them to say this is the authoritative guidance, but to give it some kind of standard, say, look, please consult this when they're man- engaging with your patient with Ramadan so that it becomes a good starting point and becomes a standardized starting point. And really, part of this guidance is to consolidate the collaborative approach between scholars and HCPs. As per the vaccination guidance that Sister Sarah showed at the start, uh, we can work together to, uh, uh, to bring hopefully beneficial uh, guidance for healthcare practitioners and patients. Um, the final point I want to highlight, uh, or the final two points, are that this, the guidance itself does not replace clinical judgment or patient choice. So there will be clinicians who might feel differently about things, that's fine, because at the end of the day, you may know something that we don't, particularly about your patient. And likewise, patient choice is something that has to be respected both from a Sharia perspective, but also from a secular perspective as well. And finally, where there is still a bit of uncertainty by it, then a religious authority is always encouraged to be consulted just to help get that uh, other opinion to help give some confidence, particularly if uh, some people are unsure in terms of following advice not to fast, for example. A number of people I'd like to say thank you to, uh, to my co-editors, uh, Dr. Gafaka, Sheikh Asim, my teachers, uh, and all the contributors and peer reviewers. Really, without their involvement, these are all volunteers, we would not have what we have today. Jazakallah khair for your time. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Gareed, for the really informative talk. Um, the guidance, as we mentioned earlier, can be found on the website. So we really would encourage people to access that both as patients and as healthcare professionals as well. So we'll move on to our next talk, inshallah. So our next talk will be delivered by Dr. Abed Akhtar, who is currently a cardiology registrar at the Bart Heart Centre in London, and he'll be giving a talk today on managing, card- managing patients with cardiovascular conditions who are wishing to fast their Ramadan. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Um, it says host disabled. I'm just trying to sc- uh, share my screen. Okay, uh, Dr. Akta, what we can do is bring up your uh, slides. Okay, cool. Shall if you let me know, then I can I can move uh, I can move them along. Just bear with me one second. Okay, can you see the slides? Yeah, I can see them, yeah, great. So just let me know when you want to move forward. Okay, sure. Um, So I'm just gonna kind of go through some of our guidance that we have formulated for patients with Ramadan fasting and patients with cardiac uh, conditions. Uh, Dr. Ghori has has covered a lot of the caveats and general principles as lo- along with um, along with Dr. Uh, Rafaqat. Um, so hopefully I can keep this nice and concise, inshallah. So if we move on to the next slide. 
so essentially I'm going to cover why there's a need for the guidance in the first place, how we formulated the guidance, what we found, our general guidance, the pathway, uh, management pathway that we formulated. And then if we have time, we can go through three case-based discussions uh, using the actual pathway in Charles. So if we go into the next slide. Great. So um, as uh, Dr. Ghori um, you know, eloquently highlighted all the massive effort that went into the formulation of uh, not only this guidance, but the other uh, uh, guidance and uh, other chronic conditions that are available uh, for, the, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a solo effort here. So you can see on the screen, there are plenty of other individuals, a lot more uh, knowledgeable and senior. Um, uh, probably more handsome as well uh, that have been involved in in the formulation of this guidance and who and who I'd like to acknowledge inshallah if we go into the next slide so the need for the guidance there are about 1.8 billion Muslims 3.4 of them are in the UK uh, according to the the Pew uh, research group they uh, have a survey of um, Muslims uh, and their observance of the Islamic faith, they found that fasting is actually one of the rituals which Muslims are more likely to observe than any other ritual within our religion, which is, uh, I guess, not that surprising. Um, so uh, approximately 93% of Muslims across the world observe fasting. And yet there is no formal guidance in patients with cardiac disease. So clearly there's a big gap right? Um, and this gap is being filled, not by clinicians, uh, at least now it is, but before, anecdotally, clinicians would be trying to attempt uh, to fill in this gap, but patients are filling this gap by themselves. Um, and we know this because there was a study that was performed. They, they surveyed around 800 individuals who were taking uh, direct oral anticoagulants, right, blood thinning medications. 50% of these individuals were modifying uh, their treatment regime by themselves. So they were skipping doses, they were taking medications that were meant to be taken twice a day, and they were taking both doses at the same time, um, or they were changing the, the interval between doses. So patients are trying to fill in this gap. Uh, and so both these points really highlight how important it is for us to fill in this gap um, properly so that patients are informed when they when they fast in Ramadan and Shah. If you could go on to the next slide, please. So what did we do? First, we looked at the evidence base. And as, as Dr. Ghori highlighted, there isn't much of an evidence base, but we'll get on to that. But we looked at the literature, search PubMed, Embase, for all the uh, studies that are available on patients who are undertaking Ramadan fasting with a cardiac condition. Um, and then we formed an expert consensus statement. So this was based on the data that we were able to find in the literature, our personal clinical experience, and as Dr. Ghori highlighted, the IDFDAR risk stratification model, which has been um, well established and, um, and used for several years now. If we could go on to the next slide. Um, and what did we find? So we looked at the evidence base. There are not many studies on patients with cardiac conditions undertaking Ramadan fasting. Uh, the studies are observational. So the gold standard that we normally like to use when trying to underpin our guidance are randomized control trials. Um, and we don't have them. We just have studies which, by their very nature, it's very difficult to really come with concrete conclusions as a result and talk about things like causation and effect. The studies are generally quite small. Uh, again, that means that any conclusions we arrive at are not very strong uh, and probably not even very st statistically relevant. The studies are poorly defined. So they use terms like, you know, uh, patients with heart failure are, seem uh, a safe to fast in Ramadan with close monitoring. And then they won't define um, what close monitoring means. Does that mean that someone is 
you know, sitting in their coronary care unit, uh, being monitored every second, or does that mean that they can be monitored, you know, with a twice a week telephone consultation? Who knows? Similarly, the diet uh, is not elaborated on. We have no idea what diet these patients professional uh, well in advance of Ramadan so that things, you know, a patient can be optimized or investigated appropriately uh, and last minute decisions aren't being made. And in a routine appointment. So I would advise all clinicians, whenever they're, most, cl most patients are seen once a year, probably at most. So whenever you see a Muslim patient, um, in clinic, always talk, and, and they've got cardiac disease and probably any other chronic disease, always discuss using our framework uh, whether they want to fast in Ramadan and try to get the ball rolling then. Um, we don't advise kind of creating appointments just to optimize uh, patients for Ramadan because, you know, as it, you know, we were already under pressure before and now with COVID and a, a pandemic, you know, it's very difficult. It's a lot of burden on the NHS to be creating extra appointments. So try to do this in your routine appointment. We advise optimizing a patient's medications. And then just, as I mentioned, bearing in mind, we're in a pandemic. And once a pandemic is over, we'll be in a post-pandemic phase for some time. So that means reduced services uh, and reduced monitoring facilities, which may have previously easily facilitated a patient's fasting in Ramadan. In this subgroup, uh, we would say if you have a previous opinion uh, from a healthcare professional about, so, about your fasting in Ramadan, probably rely on that as long as things haven't changed considering your cardiac condition and you're otherwise well. The other thing you can try, as Dr. Khoury mentioned, was trial fasting. Um, if we go on to the next slide, inshallah. So we'll, I'm going to touch on a few specifics and then we'll go on to that. We'll just briefly look at the pathway. Um, similar to Dr. Hori, I won't be able to go into too much detail uh, as you know, 15, 20 minutes is not enough. Uh, but for, let's just touch upon a few specifics. So hypertension. Patients uh, with hypertension review their blood pressure in clinic when you see them, review the medications that they're on, and specifically advise them to get a home blood pressure monitor uh, because if they have any symptoms at home, it's really important that patients are able to check their blood pressure and see whether they're, they're, they're you know, significantly hypotensive, right? That's excellent data that a GP or, health, or another healthcare professional can use to, to guide a patient. Um, next is, uh, you know, avoid, if possible, uh, antihypertensives with a diuretic activity like bendroflumethazide or dapamide. Um, obviously don't compromise a patient's uh, health care. So if that's the only antihypertensive they're able to tolerate, then so be it. You're going to have to work around that. But if you have a freedom of choice without a, a compromise in terms of uh, efficacy, then, then stick to antihypertensives without diuretic activity. Um, if we go to the next slide, inshallah. Uh, and the next slide one we're coming on to is um, patients with coronary disease. So stable coronary artery disease, generally we would say low to moderate risk. Okay, that comes with a lot of caveats as, was, as you'll see in, the, uh, in our pathway. Um, but these are patients with stable angina uh, who are on medications. Um, but mm -hmm. patients with acute myocardial infarction and post-cardiac surgery, we would advise not to fast in at least a six week window after their event. Um, mm -hmm. And to be honest, going thereafter, it's really a decision by the healthcare professional. They might have a lot of complications which will make them high or very high risk and be prohibitive for fasting. A point about cardiac rehab, every patient who has a cardiac event loves cardiac rehab because it gets them back doing what they want to do. But cardiac rehab won't allow you to uh, undertake it if you're fasting. And specifically, they say that these patients will be at increased risk of dehydration and therefore they won't be allowed to undertake it. So again, if you want cardiac rehab, you won't be able to be fasting at the time. If we go into the next slide, inshallah. With regards to heart failure, there, there's really no data on patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, and so we would advise patients with this condition, speak to your clinician, Generally, we would say 
stable heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We're going to assume you're low to moderate risk, again, with, with caveats. Um, that's the same with patients with stable, non-severe heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, i.e. your ejection fraction is more than 35%. Again, we would say low to moderate risk with caveats, as you can see in the pathway. Patients with severe or advanced heart failure, on the other hand, we would say very uh, we would say at least high or very high risk, and therefore we advise not to fast. And if we go into the next slide, you can see some features which push a patient into the uh, severe or advanced heart failure group. So class three to four NYJ symptoms, you're getting breathless on minimal exertion or breathlessness at rest. You've had one, uh, at least one admission to the hospital in the last six months due to your heart failure. Uh, you've got a poor exercise capacity. And then there's some other objective markers as well. Um, if we go into the next slide, inshallah. What about an intracardiac device? Generally, if you've got a pacemaker, uh, we would assume you'll be low to moderate risk. Um, but patients with an ICD or CRTD, by definition, you've got severe LV dysfunction or you're a, a patient with an uh, inherited cardiomyopathy. You're someone who's at higher risk and therefore we would say you, you belong in that group. Um, in these patients, if they insist on fasting, just a, a top tip is try to get an ICD or CRTD download, uh, liaise with the, the cardiac physiologist. The patient can do this himself and their routine, the, the next routine checkup, just to make sure that they haven't got any arrhythmias or threshold issues, which would make fasting an issue. All right. Uh, if we go into the next slide, inshallah. The others, so no published data on atrial fibrillation, inherited arrhythmia syndromes like Brugada syndrome, pulmonary hypertension, adult congenital heart disease, advanced heart failure therapies. Uh, I'll, I'll address that. And, and, and in terms of pregnancy, uh, there is a separate Ramadan uh, rapid review that, that can be addressed, uh, that addresses this particular group of patients. Um, if we go into the next slide, Sean. Uh, so for these group of patients, we would say in general, any condition with a significant risk uh, of dehydration or hypertension should be classed as high risk, including uh, preload dependent conditions, for example, severe aortic stenosis, um, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a large left ventricular outflow tract gradient, like a peak gradient of more than 50 millimeters of mercury, patients with poorly controlled arrhythmias, severe pulmonary hypertension, patients should be classified as high risk or very high risk. And then the niche subspecialties like adult congenital heart disease or advanced heart failure therapy, speak to your clinician because um, there are too many variables to take into consideration to give a blanket um, a statement. If we go on to the next slide, Sean. So this is um, uh, this is the, the 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 kind of traffic light recommendations um, that we would advise. Uh, so we can see that in the in the green group in patients who are low to moderate risk, where we could potentially facilitate fasting. These are all essentially stable patients, stable hypertension, stable angina, stable non-severe heart failure. Um, someone has mentioned in the chat that, uh, you know, these are complex patients that will require an extra visit. Um, I would kind of disagree. I think most patients who are being reviewed in clinic, as we can see from our pathway, probably, uh, and we've provided a checklist for, for you know, reviewing patients with uh, cardiac disease and, and seeing the suitability for fasting. Uh, assessing a patient's suitability for fasting should not add, should probably add only a, a few minutes to a, um, a patient's routine consultation. So in short, it shouldn't be something that you need to arrange. And I mean, if you can, if you've got the luxury, great. But otherwise, we, we, we are trying to make things easy for the, for the NHS and ourselves as well. Um, and from our experience, it can be done in short. Um, so we can see here that uh, if you apply this risk stratification model, uh, this will tell you which, which roughly speaking, which which group your patient falls into. But ultimately, the the, the clinical judgment is is yours at the end of the day. If we go into the next slide, Michelle. Uh 
And in our manuscript and on the, on the BIMA website, you'll find a, a table which goes through every um, group of cardiac conditions and some of the risks that we feel may be posed by a patient on those taking those uh, medications and undertaking Ramadan fasting, inshallah, something for the patient and for the clinician to be aware of. Uh, and this will factor in when you counsel the patient for fasting. If we go on to the next slide, inshallah. So this is a checklist which um, a clinician can adopt when they're reviewing a patient, uh, you know, looking at their background, their symptom status. Uh, again, a lot of this you would have covered anyway in your, in your general review of the patient whilst in clinic, but there are a few extra things uh, such as obviously establishing what the patient's risk is and then discussing in terms of their risk management uh, and then some specifics such as, you know, I've got, I'm taking the COVID-19 vaccination in Ramadan. Will that break my fast, et cetera? We go on to the next slide, inshallah. Sure. I think we might have to wrap up. Uh, okay. Inshallah. Yeah. So uh, I, then this is the pathway. So again, something for everyone to explore. Um, uh, but you can see here that once you've risk stratified your your patient, you can follow the traffic light system. And the key point and the last point I'll make here uh, is that, you know, if a patient is low risk or low to moderate risk, make sure they're compliant with their medications, counsel them about sick day rules and electrolyte abnormalities, et cetera. If they're high risk and, they insist, and they're not suitable for some of the alternatives, which Dr. Ghori highlighted, then, you know, by all means, uh, explore you know explain that patient's risks to them document your conversation and do whatever it is you can to reduce their risk whether it's liaising with the local imam or you know changing some of their medications which may be beneficial for them but if they're going to fast and get come to a greater harm then you have to kind of weigh risk versus benefit so to kind of go into the conclusion uh, you'll find more information on our, on on the beam website and uh, our manuscript of inshallah gets published, but we strongly advise that there is now formal guidance available. We definitely appreciate everyone's feedback so that we can continue to tweak this uh, guidance. And then with, when more studies become available, we'll hopefully be able to have a stronger evidence base to, to base this guidance on inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Akhtar. And thank you again for working around our technical glitches. No uh, okay, so now I have to try and get myself onto a different set of slides for our final speaker, inshallah. Brilliant. So if I just introduce our speaker quickly. So uh, Dr. Malik, inshallah, will be giving us a talk on the management of chronic kidney disease and renal transplant patients who are intending to fast during Ramadan. Dr. Malik is a transplant nephrologist and the medical lead for transplantation at University Hospitals of Coventry in Warwickshire. He has done a renal transplant fellowship at the University of Toronto and clinical research and clinical epidemiology training program from Harvard Medical School. His current research interests include health outcomes based research and promotion of living donation in ethnic minorities and cognition and transplantation. So inshallah when you're ready Dr. Malik. Thank you sister. Jazakallah khair for the invitation and for the kind introduction. Uh, Assalamualaikum everyone. I hope uh, you can hear me. So I'll be covering uh, the chronic kidney disease and renal transplant uh, part of the uh, webinar. You've already heard from uh, other colleagues about uh, the idea of DAR uh, principles and how we've uh, 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 proposed guidelines for all the different chronic diseases uh, and managing patients. So I'll be focusing on the chronic kidney disease and uh, renal transplant aspect of the guideline. Uh, so that's the outline of my talk. Uh, we'll talk about CKD stages as a refresher, uh, cover briefly the literature on CKD and fasting, uh, potential risks, uh, management recommendations, uh, very little on uh, renal transplant and also COVID-19 briefly. So CKD stages as a refresher, uh, I would just ask you to focus on three, four, and five. So EGFR uh, between 30 and 60, we would class as CKD three. 
15 to 30 would be CKD4 and uh, any EGFR less than 15, uh, they may be on dialysis or it could be pre-dialysis, but uh, with a low GFR, uh, we would class as CKD5. Uh, so CKD5 could either be a dialysis patient or a non-dialysis patient. Uh, so for the purpose of this talk, uh, I think three, four and five would be relevant. Um, so literature review. So uh, as you've heard uh, from uh, Abed and, and from Nazim, uh, majority of the studies uh, looking at the effect of fasting in CKD patients and other chronic disease patients have all been done in the Middle East and North Africa, where, as you know, the uh, fasting time can vary between uh, 10, 12 or 14 hours in comparison to uh, the West where it could be 18 to 20 hours. So it's very difficult to generalize uh, some of the findings from the studies. Um, and the studies have only included stable patients with very few CKD5 uh, patients. So majority were CKD3 and some CKD4 patients. Uh, there have been studies on dialysis patients, uh, one on peritoneal dialysis, but the rest have all been on hemodialysis. And having said that, we have had one UK study from Professor Chowdhury, uh, East London, uh, a couple of years ago. Again, CKD and diabetic CKD patients and one from Malaysia, but all the others have all been from North Africa and uh, Middle East. The outcome measures studied have also been quite heterogeneous. Uh, so they've looked at electrolytes, uh, GFR change, creatinine change, proteinuria, and at different time points before Ramadan, during Ramadan, and also after Ramadan. So it's very difficult to come to some sort of co uh, uh, conclusion. But having said that, uh, they have, they, they, there is a published systematic review and, and a meta-analysis um, uh, where 26 studies were identified, five were in CKD uh, dialysis and non-dialysis patients, the rest were all in transplant patients. And 11 of those uh, studies were in the cold season, three were in the hot season. And similar to the conclusion of the meta-analysis, the systematic review and meta-analysis both uh, came to a similar conclusion that in stable patients, CKD3 and some in CKD4, uh, uh, fasting is well tolerated, but with some caveats. So as I already mentioned, it's only stable CKD patients that have been uh, included in uh, studies, so there's already clear selection bias here. Um, and the patients who were excluded were uh, either didn't have uh, uh, stable renal function, or they had unstable declining renal function, or they had episodes of pulmonary edema or poorly controlled diabetes. Uh, and additionally, patients were also given uh, low potassium uh, diet advice and fluid balance advice, which could either be a fluid restriction or to ensure that they actually drink sufficient amounts of fluid and every uh, patient is uh, different. So it really depends on their background and their uh, CKD stage and uh, any cardiovascular disease they may have. Antihypertensives and diuretics were continued, but modified to uh, once daily uh, preparations. And those with a tendency for developing hyperkalemia, either because of an ACE inhibitor or ARB were switched to alternatives. And one study, they actually gave uh, a, a potassium binding resin, which you may have come across, uh, calcium rhizonium, to keep the potassium levels uh, under control. Uh, there's one interesting study which I can mention. So CKD3 and 5, they actually looked at uh, major adverse cardiovascular events. And interestingly, uh, any patient with CKD uh, between 3 and 5 uh, who had a background history of pre-existing cardiovascular disease, um, there was actually a high risk of uh, MACE event or cardiovascular event uh, that was associated with an increase in serum creatinine after one week. So in a patient with, uh, including the study on a background of cardiovascular disease, uh, during monitoring, if the creatinine uh, increased uh, at one week after fasting, that was actually associated with uh, increase in uh, MACE type of event. So something to bear in mind uh, for our patients. Does repeated fasting affect uh, GFR? Uh, we've got uh, evidence from transplant patients. Uh, over three years in a study from Saudi, Saudi Arabia, they actually showed no difference in GFR. It remained very similar. But uh, if you notice, the GFR is between 55 and 56. So uh, they obviously didn't include anyone uh, with low GFRs in their study. So if, you've got, if, if a patient's got good GFR, say certainly CKD3, there shouldn't be any effect of repeated fasting. So the next part of my talk, I'm going to be focusing on uh, the management aspect and 
uh, as you've heard, uh, we've got the BEMA guidance. Uh, so we've managed to publish the chronic kidney disease part of the guidance uh, recently in CKJ. Um, and uh, we've also similarly followed the idea of DAR uh, traffic light system, uh, very high risk, uh, high risk and low moderate risk. And I'll be focusing the second half of my talk uh, on the guidance. Um, so if a patient intends to fast, we would like to explore their uh, motivation and uh, risk stratify them. Um, and we would say either they are very high risk, high risk or low moderate risk. And if uh, they fall into either the very high risk or high risk categories, uh, we would uh, like them to explore alternative options, which we've already heard from uh, Sheikh Rashid, um, either fasting on shorter days, fidya, and if they still wish to fast, as many might do because they feel an intense desire to fulfill their obligation, then we would uh, try and optimize their management and put together a plan for management and emergency management plans. Moving on to the actual risk categories, the few things I'd like you to focus on. Um, so uh, very clearly, low to moderate risk would be stages one to three, CKD patients with stable function. And anyone in four to five CKD stages, either non-dialysis or on dialysis, we would uh, recommend they must not fast and be considered very high risk for complications. And similarly, if uh, patients have a uh, history of electrolyte abnormalities, they may very well have excellent GFR, but either they have Gittleman syndrome or uh, other electrolyte abnormalities, uh, then they are at high risk of complications and we would also uh, err on the side of caution. So optimization, how do we optimize them? Uh, we would uh, encourage uh, exploring motivation ideally several months before, because that then gives you time to consider medication changes and also put together a management plan. And also after the medication changes, check the renal function to make sure uh, function is stable. Uh, they're on twice daily medicines, uh, try and switch them uh, to once daily. And if they're on AC inhibitor or ARB, uh, to try alternatives if safe. I've said if safe because um, it's very difficult to uh, be didactic here because the indications are so varied for ACE inhibitors. If it's just an antihypertensive, of course, you can change it. But if someone's on it for proteinuria or for cardiovascular benefit, then it would be uh, quite difficult. So I think we just have to uh, look at the indication for the ACE inhibitor and change if safe. And also you can consider temporarily uh, uh, stopping some of the medicines. Example would be tolvaptan, which you use for polycystic kidneys in CKD patients. Um, and if you do and, uh, make some changes, uh, please recheck renal function following any medication change and also plan for monitoring. So we're talking here about CKD 4, 5 or patients with unstable renal function. Uh, so we do need to put together a, a plan for monitoring um, weekly or fortnightly. I've said weekly or fortnightly because someone uh, may very well, uh, a CKD 4 patient with, a, say, a GFR of 30, uh, could have a fortnightly monitoring, but someone in CKD5 uh, or unstable function would probably benefit from more closer weekly monitoring. And if renal function deteriorates during uh, the period of fasting, uh, then definitely we would uh, advise to stop fasting and repeat renal function to ensure um, a return to baseline. And here I would suggest that we don't necessarily follow the AKIN criteria or the AKI criteria. Uh, the reason for that is because um, the AKI criteria was actually um, developed uh, using inpatients. So they're patients who are either septic or been hospitalized. And uh, during fasting, I think it's, it's, it's slightly different. So we shouldn't be um, using the AKI criteria, but I would suggest that 25%, if there's a 25% increase in, in uh, creatinine, then uh, I would recommend that uh, you know we use that as AKI and CKD. Uh, and the rifle criteria, which was in use before the AKIN criteria, said the same thing. If it was 25%, uh, it would, they, would, they would classify as AKI. Um, then the other thing to do, uh, so optimization, um, we've covered this, uh, and education. So education in uh, CKD, um, low potassium diet advice, this is very important. The reason for this is because uh, uh, many of the food items that we uh, tend to uh, break our fast with or, or have during iftar uh, have high potassium content. Uh, 
uh, dates, for example, uh, apricots, uh, coconut, mil uh, coconut juice or water, uh, pomegranates, um, uh, oranges, or any other citrus fruits have high potassium uh, content. So it's very important CKD45 patients specifically uh, are given a low potassium diet advice. Again, you'll have to consult them on fluid overload or dehydration, um, uh, pulmonary edema or shortness of breath. Um, those would uh, be the symptoms. And fluid intake and how to keep them well hydrated uh, following if that. Weight monitoring would actually be an excellent way of monitoring, uh, self-monitoring. So I would recommend a one and a half to two kilos above their target weight. So for example, if a patient is 50 kilos, uh, then uh, they, 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 they would be safe enough to have a weight gain of uh, one and a half to two kilos um, and nothing more and certainly nothing less than 50 kilos. So if patients wanted to weigh themselves every day or alternate days, uh, that would be a good way of uh, keeping an eye on their fluid intake uh, and fluid balance. They also need to meet their nutritional requirement because if you're going to restrict their potassium, then their food requirements and nutritional requirements uh, would uh, we'll have to uh, give some attention to. Similarly, sick day rules and terminate fast if they become unwell. Uh, moving on to dialysis, um, I would expect dialysis patients to be managed at the renal unit and not in primary care. Uh, but very briefly, they will require shift changes. So if patients are having dialysis Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, during the daytime or afternoon, uh, then they're best having um, then they're best having uh, uh, to change uh, shift changes uh, uh, after iftar or fast or non dialysis days. Um, and if they're on uh, peritoneal dialysis, we can change uh, the therapies and make some modifications in order for them to fast. Uh, but dialysis patients certainly would require monitoring weekly. Education for dialysis patients, quite similar to CKD patients. Again, fluid overload and electrolyte abnormalities, uh, weight monitoring and symptoms of fluid overload, uh, and also electrolyte abnormalities. Um, next would be uh, transplant patients. Um, Alternatives, uh, as we've discussed, similar to CKD non-dialysis patients, and uh, the medication switch uh, would be quite important. Uh, the reason being um, many of the transplant patients would be on twice a day immunosuppression as extremely critical that they actually take their medications 12 hours apart, um, uh, not to cause any variation in the drug levels. So for that matter, uh, we would advise medications, which is at least three to six months prior. And we usually do one medication change at a time because they usually be on two or three immunosuppression drugs. So we would change one at a time. So if you do this three or six months prior, then we have sufficient time for monitoring. Uh, switch them to once daily alternatives, which are very easily available. Uh, I wouldn't go into the details, but they are available. And plan for monitoring graft function or kidney function during Ramadan. And similar to the CKD patients, fluid nutritional requirements um, are, are, are key. Uh, we've uh, submitted uh, uh, the guidance for transplant, the solid organ transplant patients uh, for review. So. Uh, hopefully, inshallah, that'll get published. Uh, but the two important uh, points to uh, focus on here are solid organ transplant patients or renal transplant patients in the last 12 months, we would certainly rec uh, recommend uh, that they would be very high risk uh, and must not fast. And similarly, patients on twice daily formulations for the reason I mentioned that they have to be taken 12 hours apart without any break. Uh, for that reason, they would be considered very high risk. Uh, finally, uh, COVID-19, as we know, uh, CKD, dialysis, or transplant patients are at high risk of COVID-19 uh, and uh, severe illness from COVID-19. But whether fasting actually increases the risk additionally is unknown. Uh, but uh, with lower community prevalence and immunization, uh, I would think uh, you know the, the, the risk categories or the risk uh, uh, format that we've developed uh, uh, should be sufficient to cover any COVID-related risk. The reason I say this is because CKD 4-5, which we've said is very high risk, uh, and it's the same group of patients who actually are at high risk of COVID-19 as well. So anyone with a stable function of CKD 3 uh, should be, uh, inshallah, should be safe enough to observe fast uh, without any difficulties. So in summary, um, what we've covered, we've covered the majority of studies are from the Middle East and North Africa. Studies have included stable patients. Um, uh, we would recommend a risk assessment as per the IDFDAR recommendations, uh, traffic light system. And if the patients still wish to fast and they are in their high risk or very high risk categories, uh, please explore alternatives. 
Uh, and if they still wish to fa fast, then we uh, recommend optimization prior to Ramadan, medication changes, plan for monitoring during and if required after Ramadan to make sure the function remains stable uh, during Ramadan and afterwards and educate them on the risks, including sick day rules and when to terminate fast. Uh, dialysis patients, um, would, we would expect them to be managed in a real unit. Um, so I wouldn't uh, uh, touch too much more on this. And that's it. Thank you very much. Zakala. For that really informative talk. Um, I think now we can move to our question and answer. And we have most of our panel of speakers available here for your questions. So if we get started, I'll read them out, inshallah, and then our panel of speakers can um, reply as appropriate. Um, well, some have been answered already. So first question probably to Dr. Guri is where can we find the guidance for the Bima Ramadan rapid review? So the guidance is already on the Bima website from last year. And inshallah, this year's guidance will probably be getting um, a, a new link. Uh, I'm not sure with the specifics how it's going to be. We're just in the process of finalizing things so that we don't have to keep on editing typos, for example. Uh, but the existing guidance is already on the Bima website. Uh, maybe the link can be posted in the Q and A uh, bit of the of the Zoom uh, meeting so that people can access it. Uh, I'm sure Brother Salman or somebody can can do that. And inshallah, what will hopefully happen is the new guidance will either uh, replace the old one, or there'll be a link from the existing uh, current guidance to the new guidance so that people can access both. For example, but I'm not sure of the specifics, but I'm hoping inshallah next 24 hours. The new guidance should be there, but the existing guidance is already there. Thanks, Zakla. Someone should hopefully be putting the link in the chat box, uh, but it is on the website under the projects. Uh, if you go to projects and Ramadan, then the, the, the rapid review is there, inshallah. Uh, another question is uh, Has the evidence for the rapid review been graded to make the recommendations? So uh, in terms of the guidance itself, and this is not, as I said, like a sign or a nice type guidance with actual grading of evidence. These are recommendations in the same way that if people are familiar with the DAR guidance is laid out and stipulated. So it, it takes that type of format as opposed to an authoritative guidance. But if, if we want to go down the whole grading route, then we would actually make ourselves more authoritative. And I've been very clear in stating not only in the presentation, but also in the guidance itself that these are not authoritative guidelines, they're, they're, they're uh, there as a guide uh, so that um, people can use this as a starting point, uh, signposting to either other papers uh, or, or existing existing data, but these are not authoritative, therefore the actual grading of evidence is such that it's not like sign or night. It may change in the future, inshallah, if you have more people on board and evidence space becomes more robust, but even if we were to go down a grading route, for example, with some of the evidence is so weak that it wouldn't be worth the effort because it would never reach an authoritative level. Uh, another question was, uh, are you doing any NIHR research in this area of fasting? There is no specific NIHR uh, research being undertaken. Uh, there will be no specific projects that have been applied again. One thing you have to realize when it comes to Ramadan research, and if you use diabetes as the, uh, as, as the kind of uh, index specialty example, it's very difficult to get any large scale data which, are, which have a, a sound research methodology. Um, so at this point in time, the studies are being done, they're often done uh, regionally. There are some international studies, but then you look at the actual data itself, uh, the level of data or quality of data can sometimes be lacking. Uh, so at this point in time, there's no NIHR specific projects being done. One thing you have to also realize is that in order to do these projects well, you need a, a really strong, solid infrastructure and network uh, of individuals that are able to do it. Uh, the other aspect that we have to factor in as well is that when it comes to Ramadan, actually the number of people fasting in the UK are less compared to the rest of the global population, particularly where there are more Muslim populous countries. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions for our panel of speakers? I know that uh, Dr. Akhtar has answered a few already in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Malik is also available to ask, answer questions. 
in the meantime, uh, I will go through a couple more bits from Beamer Beamer perspective. People are welcome to ask questions in the chat box. Okay, so uh, the slides seem to have disappeared, but just a quick thing to mention that um, BEMA is a not-for-profit organization um, and we do rely heavily on the efforts of our volunteers. We also rely on kind donations of uh, people in the public. So if you would like to donate towards BEMA, we would be very grateful uh, for your support. And inshallah, we will post the link for that in the chat box. We've also put in there the feedback forms for you to fill in. And once again, if you can include your email address, then we'll be happy to send you a certificate of attendance. I think we might have, there will be a recorded, there will be a recording of the webinar that is put up, uh, inshallah, with edited to, to um, account for the little glitch we had in between. So this will go up, inshallah, on YouTube uh, in the coming days. Are there any final questions? Any final comments from our speakers? My final comment is that the, the guidance that we have is an evolving project. It's something that's unique because you don't find this anywhere else in the world, particularly when it comes to other specialties. They are informative and not authoritative or prescriptive. However, the most important thing with this guidance, it highlights that we can arrive at decisions that hopefully are patient-centric and in inverted commas, Sharia compliant uh, by utilizing the, the evidences that we do have, the clinical knowledge and experience we do have, as well as understanding the fiqh uh, when it comes to fasting so that we can uh, provide patients with opportunities to make the best decisions for them. So, uh, Dr. Malik, Dr. Akhtar, any final comments from yourselves? Uh, no, thank you, sister. And, uh, you know, I'd like to echo uh, Nazim's comments um, that, uh, you know, I think that uh, I certainly find the uh, be my the Ramadan review guidance, especially some of the other specialties, which I'm not. So I, I find it quite comprehensive and very helpful when I see some patients uh, that are not kidney patients. But uh, Jazakallah for the invite. And uh, no further comments from me. Jazakallah khair. Okay, Jazakallah khair. Uh, the website, if you'd like to access anything we've discussed today, then our website is britishima.org. We are also on, in, on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So you'll find a lot of our infographics, a lot of our documents on there as well. Uh, and further information about upcoming webinars will be advertised on there. If you'd like to receive emails from us about what we have coming up, then please do join us on our website um, as a member. Uh, and once again, thank you all for your patience with our technical glitches. Jazakumullah uh, khair. All that's left for me to say is assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.